Hello and welcome to uh, what I consider to be a new project and something that I've been eagerly awaiting to do. Um, this is going to be a series of interviews and I'm going to sort of like introduce some of my friends in and sort of try and get some background information on them because these people have entertained us on YouTube for um, a short period of time or over many years and we get to know them uh, based on what we see on the screen but we don't really know where they came from or their background so this one is the first one and uh, the first interviewee or victim um, is actually going to be my friend Rock God so I'm going to bring him on to the stage right now and there we go here he is the Rock God himself good afternoon sir Hello, how are you today? I'm not too bad, mate, not too bad. That's good. So I've just uh, sort of like done a, a brief introduction. Um, I've said how you've entertained us. Uh, and oh. I want to sort of like... Hopefully know, nice of you. Yeah, and I want to know a little bit more, and I think the other people do want to know a bit more of the background, you know, from the very start. Because I think they'll get an understanding then of what makes you, you. What really upsets well not upsets you but really makes you piss boil and by the way you can swear as much as you want in this got no problems with that um, and just going to reiterate again um although i've spoken to uh nige uh a number of times i have explained to him that if there's anything sensitive anything at all that he doesn't want to go into the background of he has full reign not to do so um, I want this to be a comfortable interview, but our backgrounds are, are totally diverse and different. And we come from um, backgrounds where we could have been bullied. He's also been married and I haven't got children and I haven't. And he might wish to divulge that information or not. Um, so the format, the format, what we're going to be doing here is... We're going to break this up into five-year blocks starting from 1970. And we are going to go all the way up to present. But in the last uh, 13 years, 2010 to, uh, to 2024, it will just be a block of all of the uh, events in the news and then a free reign conversation on what you want to talk about. Um, so we're going to start now. So... I'm just going to explain to you the news that was going on between 1970 and 1974. Okay, so this is just the date stamp it, really. So in 1970, Edward Heath became Prime Minister for the Conservatives until 1974. In 1971, decimalisation, pounds and pennies replace pounds, shillings and pence. In 1972... 14 people killed and 15 wounded by the British Army in Londonderry, usually called Bloody Sunday. Oh, wow. In 1973, Britain joins the EEC, the European Economic Community, renamed the EU in 1993. And in 1974, the Free Day Week is introduced to conserve electricity. So... You're not going to remember that as a child. So I'm just going to sort of like ask you a couple of questions, a little bit about your childhood now, Nige. So my first question to you is, what is your earliest childhood memory? Oh, these, one of them, one of them's quite vivid. Well, well actually they both are, but this is going to sound so strange. They do, they do feel vivid, but they also feel a bit vague because be, with me being so young, obviously your memory's not totally there. But the two I can remember, um, I remember in the house I grew up in, I must have only been about three, possibly four. Um, and we had no carpet down when we were getting new carpets. It must have been because, and I remember being at the top of the stairs and next thing I know, I'm tumbling down on the wooden stairs down. And my mum picking me up at the bottom. Now, my sister was evil, and I don't know if she pushed me or whether I fell, but I do remember going down those stairs and actually doing like forward roll somersaults. I remember my head going down. I wasn't knocked out or anything, but I've never forgot. That's probably why I'm so touched now. 
So I remember that one. And the other one is, again, I'll have been about four-ish, I think. Three or four. I'm thinking, if I'm, I'm leaning towards four. Um, my mum always used to listen to the radio on an early morning. I remember it being like dark mornings. And we had this grey square stool, just four longish legs, and the, the seat was square. I mean, Nana had exactly the same one. I think they were homemade. I remember my mum sat on that stool, and I remember being sat on her knee, and she was like, sort of like rocking me on her knee. I woke up on the radio, and what she was singing was Nielsen's Without You. Um, and I, I can't listen to that song now without sort of bursting into tears because it was one of my mum's favourite songs. That's that's my two earliest I can think of. That's brilliant. I mean, uh, we got a little bit of nostalgia there as well in that one. So you mentioned about your sister and so forth, and you got her evil. I mean, I must admit, um, it's a little bit like that with me and my sister, um, although things are, um, are sort of softening up a little bit as we as uh, we move forward. Um, what was um, family life like for you during that period? Um, I think, looking back, I think, me, me, well, I know she was. My, my sister was about, oh, wow, seven or eight years older than me, I think. Um, and in, in the house, there was my mum, my dad, me, one sister, and my brother. I have another sister as well. All three of those, though, are from my mum's first marriage. Um, so the, I didn't think of this at the time, but when I found out, like my mum one day said, well, they're only half brothers and sisters. I was devastated because I've just always loved brothers and sisters. But my eldest sister, I never, ever lived with her. She was already up and married when I was born. Um, but I think my sister was always jealous. It was always like, the thought I was the favourite one and all that with her, with me being the only child to my mum and my dad. So there was always a bit of like bitchiness between her and me. I idolised her, but she was just shitty with me. Um, needless to say, I don't speak to her at all now. Uh, but apart from that, um, yeah, I, I think I'd like, for the time... I mean, kids would look at what happened my life then and think, Jesus Christ, that's child cruelty. But at the time, I, I thought I had a, pr a pretty decent childhood. I didn't ever, ever go on holiday or anything like that. We never had a car. But I remember every, was it every Monday or Saturday? I can't remember what the day was, but when I was little, my dad used to always, always take me into Middlesbrough Town Centre. And I always got three things every week a matchbox car some sweets and he'd buy me dinner and a seven inch single whatever was in the charts at the time because i've always been always always been into music my mom and my dad have told me on separate occasions i don't remember this that i was operating a record player when i was two so i don't know I, they've even said to me I knew what records to play. I couldn't read, but I could just look at the record label. And because of the label and the shape of the centre indents and everything, I knew what the record was just by looking at it. So I've always been into music. So, yeah, where where kids were going and getting, like, I think it was a bit too early for action, remember? They were getting, like, guns and stuff like that. I, yeah, I was getting a little matchbox car, but I was getting a seven-inch record. It was always my dad that took me. That's That's one of the sort of... I haven't thought about that for years, you know, but that's like one of the most fondest memories I think I've got of me dad when I was little. Um, but yeah, it was, it was nothing extravagant, nothing like that, no holidays, nothing like that. But I always felt, I always felt loved and I always felt um, safe. The only time I didn't feel safe was when my mum and dad used to go out to the to their local club and leave me with my brother or sister. Didn't mind it with my brother, but I hated being left with my sister because they were always told, don't have anybody in the house. Yeah. As soon as they were out, yeah. Three or four of them piling in. I just sit there quiet, terrified. But apart from that, yeah. 
that's great so we, we, we're, we're starting to build a picture now um so um you can mention you don't have to mention specifics on where you live but what sort of district did you live in and um did both of your parents work i grew up um in middlesbrough i was born and bred in middlesbrough um there's, a, there's an estate in middlesbrough called Thorntree. that's where i grew up um i remember i was in that house from apparently they moved into that house once i was born but i was only a baby so to me that's the house i was born so that that was my sort of childhood home and i didn't move out there until i was 20 or 21 and it was one of the most heartbreaking experiences i've ever done um i even remember where it was now a place called wellmead road we were the only house tiny tiny little road we were the only house on the road with a garage even though we were probably one of the only ones who didn't have a car um at the time it was like it was amazing it was like one of the safest places i'd just go out play go out on my bike and stuff mainly on my own i didn't really have any friends um apart from and this is in primary school as well at the end of the road which was basically a stone throw it was a tiny little road on the end house um there was two girls two sisters one was my age one was a year younger um and i used to basically knock about with them too they were the only ones on the road um there was some bitchy times with it being two girls and stuff uh i was friends with them for years um and if, but it was safe unfortunately i don't know how it is now but when i left it was one of the worst estates it was rough as hell it was horrible it never used to be like that. i was glad to get out that's brilliant um well, it sounds like you had sort of like a well i would have said a typical childhood life um most most uh, mothers and fathers would basically be trying to get as much money as they can together to look after their children um going out working as much as they can um and it sounds very much like you're a very creative type person being as you're able to play a record from the age of two um so i'm just going to ask you now um what was your favorite toy of that particular period because remember this is before you wow. even go, go to um you know uh, for your first pre preschool so, you know, you have to think back a little bit here on this one, I think, Nine. Uh Before I answer that, I did forget to say, yes, both my mum and dad worked. Um, my dad actually originally worked in a bakery when I was um, little. There was a massive bakery in the area called Welford's, and he was like some sort of a foreman, I think, there. Uh, always bringing stuff home and, and I think that's where he met me mum actually she used to work there but she ended up being a barmaid so I thought I, f I forgot about that bit um oh my earliest toy that I can remember I do remember one thing but I don't know whether it was mine or my mum's it must have been mine and she must have kept it you know when you get I don't know what they're called but you know when you get those um it's like two pieces of wood at the side and there's like rows of wire with the different colored plastic beads on you just slide them across it was one of them i remember that because every time she used to go upstairs i would start and play with it and i, I, I never even thought but why did she have that not me was it when i was a baby or what i don't know did she just keep it she never ever explained it to be honest i never asked um, and another thing um which i'm absolutely good and i don't have anymore was she had this big white teddy bear and it was the first thing my dad bought her and she passed it on to me when i moved up here with laura it was filthy put it in the washer all the stuff and came out it was ancient as well and it's just it's it's died now it's no longer with us there was a, there was another tie I absolutely loved, but I think that was a little bit later on. I think that was probably about 74, 75. That's that's brilliant. I think um that that um toy that you were talking about is like a uh, a child's abacus, isn't it? You know, where that's where the one. Abacus, that's the one. Um and I used to have those. I think they were coloured red and yellow, and you 
just slid along. That's right. You get you get a row of each colour. <laughs> and I don't I don't know what the point of them was. You can't use them for counting or anything, but he had one, and it was always in her bedroom. And when she used to go and like what she used to do, she'd like do, go and sort out the money for the bills and that. Out it came, and I'm sat in the bed playing with this thing. But I remember I, I like do, like playing with it with me type of thing. Very strange. Why it was in her bedroom, I'll never know. So that, that's absolutely brilliant. So we we pretty much got those five years down pat. So at the end of each block, I'm going to ask you the same thing, um, which is going to be a memorable song from that particular period. So you've got to think of a song, really. And it doesn't matter if you get the year wrong, really, but between 1970 and 1974. And you probably weren't watching films then, so I'm, I'm probably going to ask you what um, a favourite TV memory would be, you know, something that you might have... Because you you could have had a TV, I don't know. So change it to radio if you need to. But I'm then going to put a link for people to go to YouTube to listen to that tune or see a trailer for that TV show, if I can find it. Um, so after you've given me your two answers, we'll we'll have a little pause for about 10 seconds and then we'll move on to the next block. So I'm going to leave it over to you now. A memorable song, memorable TV or film if you want. Um, or if you can't even think of those two, maybe it'd be a radio broadcast, something that your mum was playing in the background. Could be anything like that. So I'm going to leave that to you now, Nigel. Memorable song. Um, I could very easily go for something that I absolutely loved by either Slade, The Sweet, um, Mr. Glitter even, anybody like that. but. As you've asked me now, the one that always, always prominently sticks out in my head is the one I mentioned earlier, which is Without You by Nielsen. Um, TV programme, wow, I can answer it, but I can't remember it very, very much about I don't remember the show at all. And the only reason I remember the characters, what they looked like in it is because I had the wallpaper when I was a kid. And it was Hector's house. I had Hector's house wallpaper. That, that's brilliant answers. Um, I just about remember Hector's house. Um, I think that was... Oh, do you know what? I'm not even sure if it was BBC or ITV. It could have even have been ITV. Uh, but I can see it now. So that's going to be good. That's going to give me a job to do because I've got to try and find a trailer or some sort of clip from Hector's house. Um, I remember Hector, was Hector a dog and he lived with two cats or a cat and something else? Something like that. It really, was, like that. really was quite early. So we're just going to now uh, pause, you know, just for 10 seconds, um, just to allow people to look in the notes if they'd like to look at that. Uh, and then I'm going to, go straight into the news so um, i'm just going to shut up now for about five seconds it's amazing how i could do that hey so we're on to now the news and we're going now to a new block of years 1975 to 1979 so these are just to date stamp and it's to give you a refresh of your memory it's to refresh that palette of your brain um, so in 1975, Iron Maiden is formed by Steve Harris. Uh, Charlie Chaplin is knighted. Um, in 1976, uh, Sid James died on stage, age 62. Wow. Uh, in the 22nd of June to the 16th of July, the British had a heat wave, a heat wave. Uh in 1977, it was the Silver Jubilee of the Queen. Um, the Yorkshire Police also called for help on the capturing of the Yorkshire Ripper. In 1978, the first test tube baby is born. Um, in Oldham, Louise Brown was the name, via IVF treatment. So it was the first IVF treatment in Britain. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher becomes Britain's first female prime minister. Yeah. There we go. 
go. Quite a big block of text there. There's certain things that I definitely remember. Yorkshire Ripper for one. Sid James is another. Um, the Silver Jubilee for definite. Um, totally in my brain on that one. Um, so um, I hope you digested that. So my question, the first one is, what was primary school, early school like? Because you're now going to... Um, to school, you know, and meeting new, uh, meeting children other than your family. Um, everything you mentioned there, I remembered. <laughs> um, there's some of the stuff that I don't remember happening as it was, but I remember, um, I remember the Yorkshire Ripper. Don't remember the actual year that it started but until you mentioned it there. Remember that, yeah. Remember everything really. Um, going to school, uh, nursery started probably 73. I do remember my first day in nursery. Terrified, I just sat there with a lump in my throat, wanting to cry all day. Um, it took a while for me to get used to it, then I was all right. When I went into sort of like infants and stuff, that's when I started making friends. Um, I actually didn't mind it, didn't mind school. It was the getting up I hated. Um, especially in the winter. Um, I remember it used to be, to begin with, my mum used to take me. Um, and then when I started going on my own, I thought I was all grown up and stuff. And it's weird. Um, the vast, vast majority of my friends, I'm talking 99% here, were girls. Don't know what it was. I think because I was so, I was a wimp. I was have been. Um, I was never into this rough and tumble rugby football, let's play soldiers mentality. I was into well, as we as we called it, let's let's get a group of girls, and I was the only boy playing catchy kisses. Win win. Um, I think I had a girlfriend when nobody else did really. They didn't really care. Catching little little cheeky pecks every now and again when no one was looking. <laughs> and, and I remember when we used to go in the playground as well. We used to all, like, fight to get to the teacher first. Who could walk around the yard with the teacher holding her hand? Very easily pleased when I, when I was little. Um, and I do remember once as well. Um, we, were, we were in, this is, I think, this is when I went into the juniors. Which will have been around about 1974, five, four, five, when I first went to the juniors. And I can't remember where it was. I was there until 79, but I remember we were going out, it was icy. And we, we decided to play some stupid bloody game like Tigs or something. And as I ran, I slipped backwards on the floor, banged my head. Went inside. There was none of this, oh, go to hospital, go to the nurse. I went into class and I had to sit down and told the teacher, oh, you're all right. That was it. Sit down. Bump on the head. And I'm sat there. I'm thinking, God, I don't feel well at all. And I was like, can I please go to the side? I think I'm going to be sick. Hurry up. That was all you got. And it was because of the bang on the head. So I must have had some sort of a uh, concussion. I don't even think my parents were informed. Think yourself lucky now. Um, so I actually went to the toilet. I was sick, but it was just a tiny bit. It was like a little, it was a little plate. And I remember it well. It was more like phlegm or something, but I did vomit. And it's because of that, not sent home or nothing. Um, how times have changed. You don't know you're born. Listen up, you walkies. Brilliant. I mean, in my own memory, I remember playing sort of like, Pig or chase, that's what we used to call it. Um, and I grabbed hold of, um, tried to grab forward to tag the other other lad. And I grabbed hold of his hood and I, I fought, fell forward. And it was right near these concrete bricks that make up plants. You know, the um, the, the wells inside are, 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 are the flowers that you'd put in. I remember them. I, I, I hit the corner and it hit me right there. But I went straight to a nurse because I was cut. So obviously there was blood. I but I can imagine, yeah. Um school was a little bit of a different time back then, and unless something was showing, wasn't it? Um 
you you literally got got next to no treatment. It was like, oh, we well, look okay then. Sit down. We got to get on with get it. on with this. Yeah. So, um, I'm just going to ask you a little bit again about your family life now that we've got a little bit of, of schooling out of the way. Um, did you eat at the table during this period, um, or did, did you, you know, like a family, or did you sort of like have individual meals sitting in front of the TV? No, we ate at the table. Um, I remember, wow, I'd forgot about this. When my brother and sister were at home, we had like this huge wooden table in the dining room. So it used to be like, you'd go in the front door, which was at the side of the house. And obviously the passage is there. You'd, you'd turn right into the door. That was the front room or living room. And then there was another door which led you into the kit, uh, the, the dining room and then another door into the kitchen. So the dining room had this huge table in the middle, big, huge wooden table. I remember sitting down there for our Sunday dinner. Um, it was old when Ramo cooked it. And then years later, it changed to me dad doing it for some reason. Um, but even like other stuff, I remember breakfast, everything always at the table. The, the sitting in front of the telly wasn't a thing at the time. You wanted to watch the telly, you didn't go in the front room with your food, you, you, you ate it at the table. Um, And then when they sort of like moved out, or at least one of them, me, my brother was there longer, I remember them going to, I'm sure, I'm sure it was a shop in Middlesbrough called Upton's. I think that's where they got it from. And she got this new table and chairs my mum did. And I think the reason she got it is my older sister had the same one. And we thought, oh, that's nice, dead posh. So it turned up. And I think what was posh was where my mum and dad were. It was a seat each. But where I sat was a bench. And it was made of this, like, it must have been some sort of compressed wood, whether it was chipboard or what, I don't know. And it had, like, white laminate round it and all over. So the old lot was white. And my God, did it have the most hideous hideous early 70s flowered pattern on it and i remember that vividly but i loved that it was so much smaller than the big table which i really don't know what happened to it went uh it'd probably be an antique now as well um and this one like fit like just under the window as well so there was like more room in the room just and and we had that for years um, but, but even then, yeah, always at the table. And then it just gradually, yeah, let's go and sit in front of the telly. Became a novelty eating in front of the telly. And then that was it. That's very similar to my my experience as well. I think the the earlier um, it was, it was around the table. And then later on, um, it would be around the TV, which brings around the TV again. So what type of TV did you own, if any? I mean, was it a colour? Was it a black and white? Did you rent it? Or was it actually something that your family bought? Um, a lot of people did rent during this period from places like Rumbelows, multi-broadcast. I don't know if you remember any of those, but I'm going to leave you to remember answer. <laughs> um, we did rent. Well, they did rent. But it wasn't from Rumbelows, but Nellis was from Rumbelows. I do remember that because I was always obsessed with her telly because you didn't get up and press the buttons. It was like a little clicky, clicky dial thing that was on the windowsill. And she used to get channels that we couldn't get, like Yorkshire. She had Yorkshire TV. We didn't. We had BBC One, BBC Two, and Time Tees. That was it. Channel Four didn't come till 82. Um, so, yeah, I always remember. The vast majority of my early childhood was always a black and white TV, and it was rented. I think at the time, there wasn't very many people could afford to buy one, even though they were both working. Um, so, yeah, it was always a black and white. A colour one eventually did come along, was rented, and my God, this thing was huge. It was like in a big wooden cabinet with a slidey open and closed like front. And the screen was big, and it was like, oh, my God, we've got a colour telly. I think you should watch any old shite just for an excuse to watch the colour telly. And then you say, oh, and this film's in black and white. No, it's a colour telly. And I, at the time, I wish I had a button to change these black and white films to colour. And then eventually, I think, uh, it had to go back, and we got another black and white one. This is after years. 
Um, because I think it was just couldn't afford to keep it up. I think it was more the license more than anything. Um, and then we had a black and white one again for quite a few years. And then eventually, when my dad retired, jumping forward um, to 1983, that was when he actually bought one. I'm pretty sure up until 83, every telly we had was rented. So it was like black and white colour, black and white, possibly colour and black and white again. But the majority was black and white throughout my childhood. Yeah, but... It's amazing when we when 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 we look at life now. But uh, my earliest memory was uh, was a was a rented TV, and we got ours from multi broadcast. The thing I remember about it was um, because I'm a little bit later than you. We, our first one was color, um, I, but I think we had a black and white one first. But I don't remember that. But the telly always had a wooden surround. It was like. Um, it was like formica. It was sort of like veneered, yeah. sort of like wooden around around the outside. And um, the other thing was is that you know, for people that are watching this, it was a time where um, there was only three channels: um, BBC One and BBC Two. But the ITV was split into districts. So where you were talking about pine teas, and your nan was getting Yorkshire, which doesn't surprise me because it was based on where your aerial was pointing, and of course. What, what the strength of the signal was, uh, we had ATV, which didn't turn into central until much later on. It was into the 80s where it was central. So we had the little um, little bought sort of like bell noises that went bing, boom, boom, da, 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 ATV. Oh, know? I remember that, like two eyes going yeah. into one. And it's sort of like it was a, it was a very flash thing. It, it sort of like, this, it sort of came on in a sort of like three cone type thing with ATV at the at the bottom. Very colourful. Um, so that was that that was brilliant to know a little bit about that. So my next question to you was: now that we've got a little bit about the TV out of the way, what was the family TV show to watch? Because you said yourself um, it was anything that we wanted to watch. So uh, after you had your meal, most people would sit down and watch something together it doesn't matter what it is it could be a soap it could be anything but can you remember what the family tv show might have been oh um i think by that point um my brother and sister were always going out i mean by then when i was five and six my brother was 16 15 16 and my sister would have been about 13 14 so they were going out hormones raging all over the place doing whatever they were doing and it was barely, basically me my mum and my dad um some of the stuff i remember watching um it was me, me it was nine times out of ten it was what my dad picked and it just so happens that i did actually like a lot of the stuff so it was oh god the stuff i remember was stuff like um i was a massive massive benny hill fan um Markham and wise um, I always found at first the two Ronnies were a little bit too grown up for me and I didn't get some of the stuff. And I always found when Ronnie Carver would sit in the chair, I found it a bit boring. Years later, I got it. But I used to look forward to the little skit sketches that do like the Phantom Raspberry Law. I used to watch that and it used to terrify me because I used to watch all the old Hammer films and anything were fangs, I had to turn away because I had nightmares. Um, a specific programme, I don't think there was a specific one, but there were quite a few where we would all watch it every week. I mean, sometimes they, they, my dad would watch anything and in the summer, I would be just out on my own on my bike or just stood on the front kicking a ball against the garage or whatever or with the two, two girls over the road playing out the front. And he, he used to watch stuff like Zed Cars and all that type of stuff. Um, and they would come on like 8 o'clock when it was still light. But there was a lot of stuff like I didn't watch. that he. I, I mean, they were used to watch The Lightly Lads. I hated it, but I was kind of forced to watch it. It wasn't like I could go upstairs and watch a portable because at, at that time I didn't have one. So, yeah, I was stuck in the front room watching one. Or, or, or I would just have to play with me toys. That's brilliant. I mean... You brought back quite a few memories um, there for me as well, um, the two Ronnies in particular, because I think if anybody mentions 
um, the two Ronnies, um, they will always mention the central core um, little um, episodic thing, which always to me is the Phantom Raspberry Blower of old London town. But the other one that uh, that comes to memory is the worm that turned. And, oh uh, God, yes! I think they did some Charlie Farr detective type. Charlie things, but, Farley, but they weren't as funny as the worm that turned. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the Phantom Raspberry Blower of Old London Town. Of Old London Town. <laughs> <laughs> so that's brilliant. So I'm going to ask you, um, because you come coming home from school and the, all the different ages and we've talked about family TV shows, there would have been a big childhood block of programmes that children watched. And after your meal, you probably ran to the... To the um to the tv like i would do can you remember a favorite tv show between that period i think the one that i remember the most was the brady bunch um my god did i fall in love with marcia brady the, the oldest girl um i forgot what the actress's name was that maureen mccormick oh my god um, I also remember uh, another program I used to watch in the seventies was Opportunity Knocks, um, and I remember very, very vividly falling in love with Lena Zabaroni as well because I was I was the same age. So when she come on doing um, Mama, he's making eyes at me. I was like, dig, 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 dig. I used to love her, uh, and it was the same with the Brady Bunch when I seen um, Marsha. Um, I watched a documentary not so long ago about them, actually. It's amazing, like, what they used to get up to behind the scenes, the dirty girl. Um, was there any more? There must have been some more as well. Oh, a, a lot of the stuff as well. On a weekend, um, on a Saturday tea time, once all that sport crap had finished, because my dad, every single Saturday, from start to finish, well, the sport. Jesus wept. I used to watch the wrestling on that when it was Big Daddy, Giant Air Stacks and stuff like that. But the highlight that I remember was a Saturday tea time, and I it's always a summer memory, this. He'd shout me in, we'd have our tea, and I always remember being like, in the summer, we always did salad, we'd watch the Pink Panther, which was a big thing on a Saturday tea time, the Pink Panther show. Um, and as time went on to late 70s, Metal Mickey was another one. <laughs> yeah because i mean um just to interrupt you there just for a second metal mickey is in the 80s uh um, yeah and um of course it was done by mickey delenz who did the monkeys the monkeys the Mon yeah. monkeys that was another program i used to love <laughs> so Forgot about that one from, from my point of view um my one of the earliest memories i've got of tv is uh, Doctor Who and John Pertwee turning into Tom Baker because I was only five years old and it was like my a granddad turning into a younger man and I was going what's what's going on don't understand this but when I think about children's TV I always think about at this particular period because it's quite still quite early um, I'd be thinking of things like Bag Puss um, yeah. Ivan the Engine Clapperboard Run Around uh, Yes, all them you know, so I, I would be ingrained looking at some of these TV shows. And I really wanted to go on something like Runaround because I wanted the toys. It was like, I just want to get on there. I don't care if I win or lose. I'll just come away with something. I don't care. I just Didn't you just want to go on to, like, run to the spot that he'd say run around now and change? change I just yeah. think, oh, I'd love a go of that. <laughs> so that's sort of that's sort of like my childhood. I do remember things like the Brady Bunch, but I remember things more like uh, Big John, Little John. Ooh. Oh Jesus! Yes, I used to love that as well. Yeah, so so my childhood is a little bit different to yours, but uh, the Pink Panther is a big one because I'll never forget the theme tune to that. Have you, have you ever met a panther that is pink? Think pink, a positively, a positively, positively pink. pink. Yeah, and I used to have the car. It was uh, I don't I think it was Corgi that did the car. Um, oh wow! And I had the pink car, uh, and I just loved the two the the tune that was in it. Um, 
it was great to see this live action and a pink panther going into cartoon going into a live action thing and driving off i mean that's really ahead of the game for tv yeah it uh, was um, and that was on believe it or not and i don't want to bring up bad memories but that was on before jim will fix it because if i remember rightly wow jim will fix it started in 1975 yes so it did we are, so we are very close to a cartoon and then jim will fix it on a saturday uh, and jim will fix it was a big thing at the time everybody loved it Oh, God, yeah. And everyone, I think everybody has a sort of like a memory of it. I remember the kids going on the roller coaster trying to eat a bloody... Uh, I remember that. <laughs> drink and drink, and, you know, and all of that. So it, it's great that we've got that. Um, I'm just going to go move on now because we'll probably be here forever talking about TV. Before you do, before you oh. do, this will shock you. I used to love Doctor Who when it was John Pertwee when I was a kid. <clears throat> And then I as think, soon as Tom Baker changed, I was like, I don't like him. He's a weirdo. Stop watching it. I think it's the granddad. It's the grey hair, the oldish look. Somebody that you went, oh, I wish that was my granddad type thing. I think you that's know? why when Wesel Gummidge came out and I found out it was him, that was it. It was just John Pertwee. I just loved him. And, oh, my God, Wesel Gummidge, what a program. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, so we're going to move on and say, what did you do? during school holidays so away from school because our school holidays were seven weeks long so we had to fill our own time in can you remember what your what the majority of the things that you did not um you know an individual thing you know like ride your bike mix with friends you know anything that you want that you can remember about the summer holidays even tv if you want um the first thing that that, that pops into my mind was actually the bike i could be out on my bike more um because like i said i was a low a bit of a loner um but tv yeah i'd get up and watch stuff like the monkeys and there was all there was always holiday programs on always during the day and the monkeys was always on the banana splits um i think they even showed a couple of beatles films one or two years i think i remember seeing was it help i might have seen um and why don't you why don't you just i can't remember what it is now I, I, I sit back and summon someone and do go and do something that's boring instead whatever it was it's not all the time i don't know why it was crap um and then I, I another thing i remember in the summer was like like i said i was never taken on holiday and when you're a kid when you get on a bus when you when you've never had a car going into the town center feels like an adventure it really does this is when you when you've never grown up with a car well about i don't know eight to ten miles from middlesbrough there's a seaside town called red car um funnily enough it's the town you get to just before you get to saltburn which is where the film got its name from um and once every single year every summer holidays that was my holiday a day out a day out in red car and my god did i get excited for it um just a little crappy seaside town going for the amusements and stuff like that there used to be an amusement arcade with like you know like a ghost train and stuff like that in but that's long gone um but that that was one of the heights of my summer holidays the my day out in red car sometimes drive there now and you think jesus wept i used to come here for a full day i used to work there as well later <laughs> but yeah when you're a kid it was like to me it felt like going to las vegas you go there now and you think jesus christ get me home brilliant i mean it, it sort of like matches mine i remember going on bikes but because of that period i do remember in the summer holidays of the queen's jubilee we had um, street things. There was a, a, a great big massive like um, party sort of like going on in our street. There'd be all the tables out there. They'd fill it with food. Somebody had put bunting all the way across between the houses. It actually did happen like that in, in Oxfordshire, where I come from. Um, TV was something that I'd watch in the morning. I'd watch something like uh, The Adventures of Robinson Crusoe, The Flashing Blade. I'd be watching sort of like tv like that but then it would be going out on your bike doing stuff with your with your friends um 
a little bit later on and very, very close to the 80s, um, some of the friends that I had in the street, they were a little, they, their, their families were a bit richer than me. So they, they had a video game console called an Atari VCS video. Wow. Um, so we, we managed to play games like combat and stuff like that. It was better than Pong. We had Pong very early on. You don't get me wrong, but if your sister didn't want to play it, your dad was off, off at work playing Pong's useless. The ball just goes off the head and you got 15 nil. That was a pretty boring game. Um, but you know, I, I was bewildered by electronics uh, as soon as we got our Binatone, or was it a grandstand Pong machine? Um, so I remember that. Um, so this last question for this section. Um, did you go to the cinema, and what was the first film you saw? Funny enough, in that period, yes, I did. The first time I went to the cinema, I think it was 1977. And the only reason I know that is because I very, very vividly remember what the film was. And I went and Googled it a couple of months ago because this was mentioned on a live stream. What was the first film you saw at the cinema? So I've Googled the re-release dates for this film and there it was, 1977. It was our friends. Like My mum was, was friends with the mother of the family and I was friends with all four kids, but the, the eldest one ended up being my babysitter, which was the boy. There was two girls, two boys. The eldest was a boy. The youngest was a boy. The two girls were in the middle. One was my age. She was my first girlfriend that I remember. Well, I think we were six. Um, and the first thing I was ever taken to see at the pitches was Walt Disney's Peter Pan. And I was in absolute awe. This, I'd never seen this humongous screen in this huge dark room before. I was in total awe. Absolutely loved it. Yeah, my... My first recollection, because I did actually ask those questions as well, but it might not have been me that asked, that asked the, the question that you gave a particular answer to. But um, I know that my answer to it was is that we went to something called Children's Club. It was a Saturday cinema thing that you paid, that your parents paid 50 pence and you would wow. watch a Laurel and Hardy, a cartoon and a major, a major, a major film. And sometimes it was a double bill. And my earliest recollection was a Disney double bill. And it was, I think, the Aristocats and Robin Hood. Um, Robin wow. Hood with, animal, with animals. I thought, well, this is weird. But um, that was pretty much, it was a lot of Disney stuff. Later on, we would see films like um, Meteor and, uh, you know, more adult orientated Escape from Witch Mountain. I remember that one as well. Um, but at that particular time, it was mostly the cartoons. And there was even Flash Gordon episodes. You know, they showed the old 30s Buster Crab Flash Gordon episode things because they enticed oh, you to God. go back. They enticed you to go back each week. And so it'd be the next episode. If you didn't go, then of course, you know, the six episodes and you only saw three, it didn't make sense. So, you know, you, you you tried to be part of that club and go every week. So and it was 50 pence. So that was great. I do remember when I went to see Peter Pan. You, you in in back in them days. Jesus, never thought I'd hear myself say that. You did used to get two films for your money. It doesn't matter whether it be a cartoon or you go and see an adult oriented film. It could be a horror, anything. You always, always got two films. They did take me to the cinema again later on. I, I saw One Hundred and One Dalmatians with them. Um, I went three or four times with them, I think, from what I remember. Pete's Dragon, that was another one. And you always got another Disney film with them, but it it wasn't like a double cartoon. You got stuff like Peter Houston off in uh, One of Our Dinosaurs is Missing. I remember seeing that one. Um, the Cat from Outer Space, I remember seeing that one. Um, I can't remember a thing about it apart from the cat with this collar, and I absolutely loved it. Loved it. I'd love to see that film again and the Peter Houston off one. I remember that cat had a collar. Yeah, with a light on. Yeah, with a light on it. It's amazing what I can sort of like remember of that particular period. And and you're quite right. Peter Houston off seemed to be part of my childhood because I remember seeing things like Agatha Christie's Evil Under the Sun or The Death on the Nile or whatever it was. It was that sort He's of in film. everything. <laughs> so it's amazing that we do that. And you know now that we've got to the bottom of this section. 
And I now need to ask you again, um, between 1975 and 1979, remember, uh, yeah. a memorable song. And this time it can be, you know, remember, it's memorable TV or film or both, if you wish. It's up to you. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, those programs, but go, go, whatever just, just comes into your mind that goes, that's quintessential what I remember about 1975 and 79. So it's a tune, TV slash film. Right. Um, from 75 to 79, there is so, so many songs. Because by that time, I was well and truly into music and I was going out and getting my own records and and stuff like that. Um, I was I was heavily into the whole disco thing and Saturday Night Fever soundtrack and when Grease came out. Massive, massive Grease fan. I'd never seen the film, but I wore that soundtrack out and I bought every single, even though I had them on the album as well. Uh, again, parents wouldn't take me to the cinema. I longed to see Grease at the cinema. I never did. Um, but I think I'm going to go for a song that ended up being a real game changer for me, which was in 1979 and stays with me till this day um what you got to think is at the time i was listening to stuff like oh wow boney m um bg's darts like daddy cool and bring back uh, come back my love and all that type of stuff um oh wow all that type of stuff even stuff like um the stranglers before I realised they were a punk band, um, the Crunch by the Ra Band, all that type of stuff, which was instrumental. And then in 1979, this song came out, and I was like, "Oh, love this! I'm gonna go and get it." I totally missed out when punk started. I hated, hated with a passion, the Sex Pistols. I think the first thing I ever heard of theirs was pretty vacant. And I remember like just being in absolute disgust watching the telly. So then in 1979, this song came out. And I was like, oh, it sounded like an old, like beefed up rock and roll song. And I, I listened on the radio and I got the side tongue, song title. I was like, right, it's called Something Else. I found out later on it was an old Eddie Cochran song. But when I got it in the charts in 1979, I, I went into the shop. And I said, have you got a song to the chest called Something Else? Yes. And I went and got it. And I seen when he pulled it out, and I had this weird little cartoon picture sleeve. I was like, oh, that's a nice sleeve. When I took it out of the bag, I was mortified to find out it was the Sex Pistols. But it was Sid Vicious on vocals, not Johnny Rotten. So that was why I didn't recognize. I was like, I'm taking this back. I don't like it. Then when I played it, I thought, now nah, they've given me the wrong record. So when I played it, I was like, my God, it is them. I tell you what, he was a pretty good singer, was Sid. Um, and then I flipped it over and played Friggin' in the Rig, and that's it. I'm definitely keeping this. And that was the start of me getting into punk. It wasn't long after that that they released Silly Thing, which was a lot heavier, and it was the guitarist singing. So I was actually into the um, the great rock and roll swindle stuff before Nevermind the Bollocks. I then appreciated the Nevermind the Bollocks, Johnny Rotten era, once I'd worn out started to wear out my great rock and roll swindle um and the other one the tv show so yeah i'm gonna go with something else bad sex pistols tv show wow oh god there's that many um wow or film i can't say jaws because i didn't see that until 1980 so i've just missed out um, and you missed that in your news as well. Yours was released. How dare you miss that out? That could be in the next block. It's it. Remember it's. Um, what film did I see? I'm going to. I'm going to actually say. Um, Peter Pan because that was the first one I seen at the cinema. Although I like 101 Dalmatians better, I love Peter Pan, um, and that was the first one at the cinema. So that is the that's the film I'm going to go to. And I do remember coming out of that. And it must have been Dark Nights as well, because there was a there was a, 
a poster up. You know, you get the quad posters inside for this film that was coming out, and the poster looked horrific, and I was always drawn to it. And it was uh, Joe Dante's Piranha. And I was like, love that poster. I still want that poster to this day. I love it. But yeah, I'm going to go, yeah, something else by the Sex Pistols uh, and Disney's Peter Pan. Absolutely brilliant. Thanks, Nige. Um, like I say, that's now reached the end of the first decade, and it's taken us 55 minutes, by the way, just to give you an idea. I know. <laughs> um, we're going to go on as much as possible. I don't really want to do this in two parts, but I'm loving it so much that... I also want to keep the quality as it is. It's it, 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 it's looking amazing, and I'm, I'm really enjoying this. So we'll just go, and then when we get to a point where, no, I think we need to need do this as a part two, that's fine. Um, yep. Because, you know, I mean, we'll, we'll soon find another spot that we can do this on a Sunday afternoon or whatever it is. Yep. And, and hopefully people are going to really enjoy this. So I've got a little job to do. I've got to find those memorable... <laughs> songs and everything i've set myself up here haven't i and um we i'm just going to give ourselves that five second ten second pause for people to look at the notes underneath um so i'm going to shut up bloody hell do you know what i can't actually hold my breath for five seconds anyway um uh, we're now moving to the 1980 to 1984 era i think for most people this is a very growing up period the 80s is to me an exceptional period um yeah but i'm just read out the news to you i've got some questions and all that sort of stuff so this is the news between 1980 and 1984 um we've got john lennon is killed in new york and the ford escort is launched um in 1981 the brixton riots occurred uh and uh, between the 10th and 12th of april charles and die got married in 1982, uh, the Falkland conflict occurred between the 2nd of April and the 21st of June, and Pope John Paul II visited the UK with the Pope Mobile. Do you remember that? Anyway, uh, 1980, yeah. Thatcher wins by a landslide and becomes the Prime Minister for the second term. Uh, the uh, this in this particular year as well, uh, Breakfast Time and TV AM were started. Um, pretty much within weeks of each other. The CD is launched and the £1 coin is launched. So the note is out and the £1 coin is in. And in 1984, uh, the miners' strike uh, started um, in March 84 for 12 months and Torval and Dean win gold at the Winter Olympics and with Bolero. That is the news. So we're now with that in your brain, and there's an awful lot there that you're probably going to go. I remember every single one of that. I'm really sad because that's how I feel because I know every single one of those. Um, I'm going to ask you the question. Although the VHS recorder was launched in 1978, when did your family or yourself get one? Uh, 1983. I was 15, and my dad had just retired. Um, he worked at ICI at the time, um, and he took well, what they called the golden handshake, which is like a sort of a, I think it's an early retirement. I mean, he, he was, he must have been getting out. He was being, I think he was 64, 65, uh, and he took it early and he got, he, he got like a payoff and, uh, I don't know, some sort of food hamper and handshake and all this type of stuff. And that's what he got. He he said, I'm I'm gonna get um a brand new colour telly and a video. So that's what he got. Um I think that was May, if I remember right, May eighty three, and it was an Akai top loader and a Panasonic telly, and that telly lasted for years. That's brilliant. I mean, I do remember um of that particular period, the same thing happened to my granddad. He got a 25-year uh, award, and they gave him a gold watch from the Queen's Jewellers because he worked for Alcan, an aluminium company, wow. a huge uh, manufacturing plant. Um, but he also then would have got his pension, and it would have been called the Golden Handshake back then. It was yeah, a slightly different time on how pensions and everything work. You, 
but uh, I do remember that watch and it has been passed down through the family. It went from me though to my nephew um, when my dad died because I was I was I, I was given it um, and I decided that I'd keep the sovereign ring from my mm -hmm. father um, and I gave the watch therefore down to my nephew um, to pass it down the line. Um, I thought it was only pertinent because of where uh, that my nephew is in the family. So that was a great answer for that. Um, so with that, what was the first film you ever rented? When I got in from school, um, I knew that we were getting the video that day. And I swear to God, I've never known a day school drag so much. I practically ran home. I was dying to get in and see this thing. Um, when I burst in the front room, it was there. I was like, oh, two items of sheer beauty. And uh, the, the where he got them, it's, it's not even there anymore. It was a little shop called Borough Electronics. And they had their own little tiny video library as well. I think it must have been like one or two little shelves. Um, and the two films that my dad brought home, uh, he got Dressed to Kill with Angie Dickinson and Michael Caine, which I'd wanted to see, but I was a bit, mm. um, and Jaws for me. He knew how much I loved the film when I saw it at the cinema in 1980. So he rented that for me and he knew it was my favourite film. Um, so I was, oh, I was over the moon. I made him watch it as well because he was like, I'm not watching a film about a bloody shark. He actually quite enjoyed it. He said it was a bit daft, but he did enjoy it for what it was. So he got them two on the same day with the video on the celly, dressed to kill and Jaws. Uh, that's brilliant. Um, I have to say to, to people out here that there was no such thing as blockbusters. These were independent no. of video rental stores. And depending on the size of it, it was split to two sides. There was a Betamax side and there was a VHS side. And they were all sectioned yeah. out. Um, but certain stores would be just VHS. Um, even then, I think people realized that Betamax was losing the war. Yeah, I think it was because of how many people had Betamax players and how many people had VHS players and how much was being rented. I think that I remember our video store diminishing every month with the Betamax side, and it was going more around with the VHS to the point where there was next to nothing. Um, mm -hmm. But Betamax was the way to go. I remember we had a Betamax player and a VHS player. Um, the Betamax player then became my own player. Um, and yeah, video nasties became a bit of a thing, but not until a little bit later on in my life. I have to go a little bit further along, um, uh, along with that. So um, I will just add something is that although I can't quite remember what the first rental was, what is very prominent in my brain was my dad returning from the factory that he worked at with a pirate tape. And I remember it was either E.T., it was either E.T., or it was Rocky Free, And it could have been both. And that is the vivid memory of, oh, that's only at the pictures, and putting it in, and the picture quality was shit. And I was going, oh, I'm watching it without having to go to the cinema. It's there, and it was all snowy and shit. Uh, and my dad then had to return it then to work, where it would be passed on to the next employee that was at my dad's works but that's an incredibly vivid memory for me uh of pirate tapes and uh of course we don't do that thing anymore do we nige so no. move on to the next one unless you want to act but just before we you know you answer this next question you can bring your own memory into that uh but did you record and keep your tv broadcasts of that period with your video recorder Yes, I did. But before I tell you about that, uh, I do remember the first pirated film that I saw. And I think I think my brother scammed my eldest sister a bit on this one because she had a video about a year, year and a half before we did. Uh, and my, my brother used to go to the youth club, all his mates, uh, and he had a VHS of this. And he said, oh, to my sister, do you want to rent it? It was like three or four quid. For a, for a pirate tape. And I was like, can I come to your house and sleep tonight and watch it? And she let me in. It was Poltergeist. <laughs> it was still at the cinema. Everybody wanted to see it. 
I said, do you think you're really being charged? She went, look, I've paid the money. I'm not bothered now. If it is him, it's so I know I've paid for it. And we watched it and it was really bad pitch, but we really enjoyed it. Um, yes. Yes, I did used to record stuff off the telly. I remember the very, very first program that I recorded as well. Um, and my dad had got us like the these VHS blank three hour tapes, and they were I remember them vividly now as well. The the, the cardboard slip was like an orangey red, and they were made by Granada, and they were E one eighties. <laughs> and the first thing I remember recording was the episode bomb of the young ones. Oh my God. And I watched it over and over and over. I didn't get the first two episodes because we didn't have the video for them. So when I, when the, when the young ones was repeated demolition and oil, uh, the first two episodes were, were all brand new to me. Everybody else had seen them though, but I hadn't. Um, but yeah, I also, the, the, I did a really stupid thing once. It was the same year we got it as, L, as well, 83. So it was all still brand new. I had the opportunity, to which I'd said yes to originally, to go and see. And this is one of my biggest regrets. I had the chance to go and see Thin Lizzy on their final tour on the Thunder and Lightning tour, which for me is one of the greatest records. It's really heavy, and I loved it. And I was all set to go. And then, because I was 15-year-old, and I used to look at a tree leaf and get a stiffy, I fancied this lass on Grange Hill so bad. And it wasn't one of the more famous ones. She was always in the background. The actress was called Lisa York. And I think her character was Julie Merchant or Julie Marchant. And because I fell head over heels on this, for this lass on the screen, I forfeited going to see Thin Lizzy to buy three three hour tapes so I could tape the entire series of Grange Hill. What an idiot. It wasn't that long after I recorded over them. Brilliant. Um, yeah, I, I've got so many memories of what of, of recording stuff. I think this was a period of time where my parents realised that I was a technical person. I was able to change a plug on an electrical device at the age of five, like much in the same way that you were able to put a record on a deck and, and understand the needle and, and, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, we had a big gramophone, by the way. It was a great big, massive wooden piece of furniture. I mean, with a huge speaker, and it was a, the radio took up like most of it, and there was the record bit at the end. Um, I remember that, and it was mahogany as well. That's what my nan had one of them. <laughs> mahogany. Um, it, it's we're we're, we're going to sort of like move on to a sort of a sensitive thing to me because. One of the questions I'm going to ask um, is going to move us on a little bit, which is, um, did you leave school during this time um, or did you continue with education? But before we get to that question, I just want to uh, breach the subject that during this period for me, and I did leave school at the end of this block, it was more 1985 than it was 84. I was bullied at school and it did shape me um, at school. I was nervous about going into school on certain days for being picked on. Um, the school teachers really didn't want to know if you were running behind uh, because if it was raining, you couldn't play football. You went on a cross country run. Uh, they would just say, get your fat ass going, you know, and while all of the other kids that were the bullies generally, they were at the front. They, they were able to have a lark and sort of like have a crafty cigarette in the hedgerows or something, you know. Um, the school teachers just didn't care on cross-country runs. And there were certain times in, in, in um, particular subjects where I just couldn't concentrate, specifically maths and English. And I do blame an awful lot possibly of me being nervous about standing up at school and, and talking and all of those sort of things down to that bullying. It was like you could see your their eye line 
in the class while you're at the top and you're going, I just don't want to be here because if I'm in the background and dark, then they'll leave early and I'll be the last one out and I can hide and disappear and um, I wouldn't be the focus. Focus. If you're standing up in the front, you're the focus and they're going to remember that and they know that you're there and you're going to be picked on as soon as you come out of that. And those are the subjects that are in me. So I'm I'm going to ask, you can answer your own qu uh, thing about your 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 thoughts about secondary school because I want to just make it clear secondary school was great. It's just that bullying was a part. Um, so did you leave school during this period or did you continue your education a little bit longer? And if you want to then talk about bullying yourself, by all means, feel free to do so. Before I answer that again, quickly, when you had your gramophone, do you remember you had to flip the needle round to play 78s? It was a bigger needle and could you, you couldn't play 78 on a normal start. You had to click it round. And then when you went back to rec seven inches and LPs, you had to click it back round again. It was, on, it was on a white pivot with red writing, which would have been then when you turned it round, the red writing. That's right. Outside, yeah, it was on that's right. So, yeah, um, I left school in 84. I started the seniors in um, September 79 when I was 11. And I left just after the exams, really. It'll be in about um, June, July time, 84. Um, the majority of my senior school life, I absolutely hated. I was bullied. Um, it was mainly my bullying, my bad bullying started from third, third year right up until leaving. Um, and it was by one person. Um, and I think the reason I was bullied is because I, believe it or not, was the quiet loner. Um, I used to knock about with the quiet or the wimpy kids or the, the, the not so much wimpy. They would just keep themselves to themselves. Weren't parts of any groups. Well, we had our own little sort of geeky group. Um, and we were mainly made bullied for that. Some of the lads that the bullies would talk to, but I wasn't given the time of day. There was one of the big bullies who didn't bully me. I don't know why he didn't bully. If anybody ever threatened me, he's, I've known him once or twice to stand up. He didn't, if he was there, that is, he wouldn't go out of his way. But he was never really horrible to me. And he was like, I think he was considered the best fighter of the school as well. When, when we were in fifth year, he never, ever, ever bullied me. But this bastard who did, and I still feel bitter to this day about it. Um, the reason he bullied me from what I can gather is not only was I quiet, was because I was into the, the heavy metal stuff, like the new wave of British heavy metal, Iron Maiden, Judas Priest, Rainbow, that type of stuff. He was into all the scar stuff, madness, the selector, bad manners, all that shite. Um, I didn't like it to begin with, but when he started that, I think that is why I, I had this deep-rooted hatred for scar. And 90, 99, 98% of it was mental abuse. He did, as physical as it got, was either a grabbed the scruff of the neck or he was sat behind me once and it was like a wooden chair and you got the backrest and there was always that bit open at the back from the seat and the backrest and he was behind me and he just like started like booting my ass like proper <clears throat> and then when I turned around he just looked at me like with this evil glare so I turned around again and he did it again and he did it again and he did it again and he ignored him and i was just like stomach tense and everything and i was like yeah i don't want to be here there was another time i remember um it was really raining and we were all oh oh it was raining it was really raining uh, and we were in this area where you would go for your break because you couldn't obviously go out because it was bouncing and he just 
it was more like a bit of a, like a big corridor type of place. And I remember him walking through the door and I'm stood in this corner just talking to somebody. And he started walking towards me with his arms like that. And he was like, got right in my face, like snorting. And I was like this, cowering away with my eyes shut, waiting for him to hit me. And he walked away and he found that hilarious with this friend. Um, I missed a lot of school time because of him. I did not dare tell the teachers. It wasn't, from for me, it was too dangerous. Um, and also, I used to get a hell of a lot of migraines. Um, to the point where I would be off school. It was, I think I, when I don't was a teenage thing. And I, I do get them again now. Thankfully, nowhere near as frequent. But I went for years without. And I sometimes wonder, was it the stress of him? But because I knew what I was going back to, I used to tell me, mum, sometimes I was ill when I wasn't. Just so I felt safe and didn't have to go back. I missed a lot of school. Um, which obviously did interfere with later life because I was I just didn't learn what I should have done, really. Um, and the relief when I left school was absolutely unreal. I didn't go to college. School was enough for me. I thought, no chance. So what I did when I left school, I went straight onto one of those, don't exist anymore now, YTS, Youth Training Scheme. And that's where I got placed at, um, it was a local company called McKenna and Brown, and it was a TV hi-fi shop. Um, and a lot of what they sold was high-end stuff. I mean, I'd never seen so many things like um, Sony, never heard of Panasonic, but they had this stuff. I like, what the hell is that? It was Bang & Olufsen. They sold Bang & It was the only place in Middlesbrough, I think, that sold it. Oh, there was one of two, and we did, and I absolutely loved it there. The only thing I didn't like about that job when I was there was when the shoplifters come in, because I was, like, terrified. I thought, I can't do an out here. Um, so yeah, that, that was my, and when the part of the youth, the youth training scheme I was on, I got a, a city and guild certificate out of it for retail distribution. So that was when I started getting into like wanting to work in shops and stuff like that. But I ended up want I didn't want to work in the shop. I wanted to be a van driver after going on some deliveries and stuff. I loved it. But yeah, I am many years later as well. I got, my sister said to me, cause she used to work at Asda. For a do you remember the frozen company called Ross? She worked for Ross, stacking up um, all their freezers. So I did a night with her. And as I'm stacking the freezer, I seen somebody come to argue with a baby buggy. And they went, excuse me, where do you know where the so-and-so so -and, -so and I looked up. It was the prick who bullied me. And I just looked at him and I went, oh, there. And he went, Ah, I just turned away. And this is going to sound so bad. So bad. But about, I don't know. I was in this house, so I'm, it must have been seven, eight years ago. Popped into my mind. So I went searching for him on Facebook and I found him. And there's a photo of him laid up in hospital with all these things on him. I'm assuming he must have had a, a heart attack or something. God, this is awful, but I can't tell you how good that made me feel. That was one of the biggest save yourself right moments I've ever experienced. Kind of felt guilty for thinking of it, but I thought, what I've just thought, there's nothing what you put me through compared to what you put me through. So, yeah, I was glad to get rid of him. And then once I got on my YTS scheme, yeah, I, I, felt, I felt better for that. I was out of school. I was away from it, but he was the main reason I hated it. No, that's brilliant, Nigel. Thanks for opening up. Like I said, you didn't need to. Um, I myself, like I say, was a subject of bullying. Mine was serious at one point. Um, some people might know this term, um, but I was, I was, I had what they call posting done to me, uh, where one person grabs one leg, and somebody then grabs the other leg, and they push you in between a tree slamming you against your balls basically against the tree and it's called posting wow it, it caused me such um 
about six months of severe problems um, for me. Um, but I still, I, I want people to know that even though something like that happened to me and mostly it's weight related or jealousy based on, you know, how intelligent you, you could portray yourself to be, you know, um, some people might have even thought of me as being middle class. Uh, because a class system was there. Some people were turning up with holes in their knees. I never did. Yeah. I, I, every year I'd go in with a new protractor and a new pencil and a new school bag. And there was others that were still wearing the stuff from last year. A lot of that, we, we got to remember that during this period, people were at different parts of their life. But the 80s, to me, is that period of time where I look back and I go, That's, that is the biggest growth period of my life where I experienced probably more things than any other decade that I can I can even that I can remember. And that goes into the 90s as well, where I'm in my 20s, and you'd think that that would be a period where I would normally be talking about, but I'll never, ever talk about the 90s like I do the 80s to me. Mm. It is, is me, even though all this bad shit was going on. Um, so... You know, um, there's one thing that happened in the 80s I would like to tell you because it really it was one of the biggest shocks. You just remind me there when you said people used to go to school with holes in their trousers and stuff like that. This poor lad, he was like, he was just like the likable little dickhead, really. Everybody liked him, but he got picked on and all the bullies would use him for stuff. But I got on with him and he was canny. And he'd have his dinner and he'd always up there for seconds and used to think, you greedy git. Thinking back now, wow, I wish I'd done something about it, but you didn't know. And the more and more he come to school, the scruffier he got. I thought I was bad because I didn't used to get new trousers every year. Mine were getting like faded and half masked and stuff, but there was no holes. This poor lad. He used to come to school with these awful shoes, like old man brown shoes, to the point where the soul was giving it this. And this is in the 80s, not the 60s or 70s. Oh, and he got terrible, terrible bullying for it. And he used to put a little smile on his face. Can't, he was only a little lad. And he came to my house one night. Um, I think he he either gave me or sold me for a pound the um, Motorhead Ace of Spades 7-inch single. And because I got it off him, I wish to God I still had it now. Um, I'm not going to say his name, just in case anybody who I know watches this from Middlesbrough knew him. Um, they probably won't. Um, but I had my tea given to me. And I wasn't allowed anybody in the house at the time. So I had to sit in the passage on the stairs with him there. And I was giving him bits of my tea and he was taking it. And I was thinking, Jesus. And I never thought at the time because he was dressed like that. He must have been, there must have been horrible to him. Because he had a sister who didn't look like that. And then, like, my friends at the time who I'd met at school were saying to me, oh, he's uh, he's gone in the army. I was like, really? Fair play to him. And then there was a few years down the line, they went, oh, have you heard about this lad? I went, oh, no, what? They went, he's dead? I went, what? Yeah, he was in the army. He um, put the barrel of a gun in his mouth. God knows what demons that poor lad had. That, that's Sorry to bring it down, but I just thought I have to, um, I have to share that uh, with you. But uh, I, 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 this, this is the sort of thing that I want this sort of like interview to sort of be. It's to to open up and you know, and people will know what shape you, what shapes you. You know, um, we'll talk about later on the persona that you portray in YouTube, but that'll be much later on. But these yeah. things that are happening to you now subliminally are probably there and therefore drive you in a, a different direction that an, another person would be. So that's the whole point of this, by the way, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, girls and boys, all two of you. There we are, just to, <laughs> just, just to bring in a famous saying there. Um, some of these things will, will be prominent to you uh, or, uh, uh, or not. 
uh, Nigel, but we can't avoid the fact that um, in the 80s, between 1980 and 1984, computers were a thing, right? Yeah. There was a boom period, and not everybody had one. Not everybody was technically minded, and some for other people, it completely slipped them by, and it might have completely slipped you by as well. But I'm pretty sure there would have been discussions in the playground swapping of tapes over and all of that sort of stuff so we'll just quickly gloss over um the computer for the for the for the home boon started here um did you own one um and what are your memories of the home computer boon for yourself i didn't have one myself at the time but my like i say i mean my eldest sister who had like a son older than me and a son younger. We were all like a similar age within three years of each other. Especially, it started off with the younger one, but the older one I was very, very close with. He was the one who I went to see my first concert with in 1981, which funnily enough, as I mentioned earlier, was Thin Lizzy. I was 13 and that was December 81. So I was really close with him. Um, and one Christmas, it, oh, I couldn't tell you the year, they got um, a ZX Spectrum. And it was the old little ones with the rubber pads. And I remember going, because I used to sleep there every weekend, stay over. And I remember when I went, I went, what's this? This is the computer. And they were playing at the time. I think it must have been. It was either just, was it called Kong or Donkey Kong? And I remember when it loaded up, when it started, like, you'd get these weird noises, like the ramps were all like this, and they'd go, eh, 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 and go like that. So then you'd run up them like that and dodge the barrels and all that type of stuff. I remember having to go on that. And then the next game that I had to go at, and I absolutely loved it, was Attic Attack. Uh, I would love I would love that game again. I, could, I always got the pieces of the key, but I could never get it in the order to get out of the house. I'd never completed it. I had the ACG key, and there was another little bit for it, I think, but I, I could not get out of that house. Never completed it. Um, I think the first computer I got from what I remember didn't have one at home. It was when I was with my ex girlfriend, who I didn't marry, by the way. I've only ever been married once and I'm still married to her. The one I had the kids with, I never married her. Uh, but the was it early? It must have been early 90s. This boom came out and they re released the spectrum but it was a proper keyboard one and you got the tape machine with it as opposed to having to buy a little tape recorder separate and plug it in to load your games so we got one of them uh and i got copies of these attic attack and stuff like on on like you know, I copy them tape deck to tape deck didn't matter about what sound quality the beeps were there picked it up um but i remember the first game i bought was jaws and it was god it was shit but I wanted it because it was Jaws. So, yeah, it took me until the 90s to get my first one. But I do remember the um, the first one I seen at school was the – it was another Sinclair one. I can't remember it. Was it X11? Or so? I can't remember what it was called. Little square thing. You'll know. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, so many memories come flooding back with that. Attic Attack was done by a company called Ultimate Play the Game. And the reason wow. – and the, and the reason that you were picking up a key with ACG was because the company was called Ashby Computer Graphics back in the year, back back in the in that period. And um, their early titles were things like Jetpack, um, Trans Am. Forgot about uh, Jetpack. Yeah, uh, there was a um, lot. The, the, take it like this: there were a lot of 16K games, and there were two types of Spectrum. There was a 16K and a 48K. You're quite right there. The rubber keys. Um, there, this was a boom period of Manic Miner, Jet Set Willy, all sorts of stuff. God, yeah. Um, and the, 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 I, I will say for that particular brand, Spectrum, the copying was a lot easier, than, I think, than the other machines that I owned. Um, one thing that a lot of people didn't realize was that you didn't record in stereo. You recorded in mono to get the best accuracy because that high-pitched noise glitch is – picking up on a mono head so if you recorded yeah. in stereo yeah. you would draw you have signal drop because there's what they call the azimuth alignment head there's a head that moves up and down that 
goes over the tape and you could you alter the screw and it was called the azimuth alignment i knew all of this because of the technical side of things in me but um my computers were the zx80 the zx81 uh the vic 20 the commodore 64 um i did for a short period of time have an auric one an auric atmos um I didn't have a Dragon 32, but a friend of mine did. Um, and that's pretty much the computers that were of that time. Because later on, what you were talking about, Spectrum was sold to Amstrad. And when it was sold to Amstrad, it turned into a proper keyboard. There would have, been, right. the, there would have been the Spectrum Plus 2, the Plus 3. And Amstrad brought out their own line called the Amstrad CPC 464. Um, which came with a green screen or a color screen and with an inbuilt tape deck. That's where you were talking about the tape deck was built into it. Um, so that's a little bit of back history with computers. Like I say, that's for my friends on the computer side that will be also listening to this. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't want me to skip past things. Uh, for me, ZX81, that was the one. Yeah, the ZX81 was a black and gray keyboard. No, there was no. It was touch. There was no key travelator keyboard. It was. It was flat. tiny, wasn't it? Oh yeah, very tiny. And yeah. the ZX80 and the ZX81 came in kit form or bought. You could buy it in kit form for seventy nine ninety nine, or you could buy it um, already made from W H Smith generally for ninety nine ninety nine. And the first thing that you bought for it was a 16K RAM pack that you would put in the back, and that would blow the thing up because it wobbled. One thing about it was it wobbled. And the Spectrum had no joystick ports. So you bought um, an expansion pack for the Spectrum because you wanted to put joysticks in <laughs> because there was no joystick ports. This Spectrum was hot, rubber-keyed, and to some people the most fun time they'll ever have with the computers in all of their lives because it was that it, you switched it on and you do nothing. There was no menu, no game instantly coming on. It was a flashing cursor with ready. What, what, what do I do now? You know, my, my friends would go into curries and type in 10 print. You are a git. 20 go to 10 and have it you are a git coming up down the screen with a bloke from curry's and uh, dixon's chasing you out the store saying get out of here you kids and all that with, with you are a git being all over the screen with a flashing border and all that sort of stuff we used to do all of that we were right 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 uh tech, tech heads nerds that we thought that was the height of oh we're gonna get in trouble if we get caught just i was gonna say back then that was quite rebellious wasn't it <laughs> now you'd get twatted for being a dick and like i say head of nerdism but um i'm gonna move on now to there's the last three questions now um portable tvs for the bedroom became common during this period did you get one yes i did i got um if i remember rightly i think it might have been an amstrad actually which is a little black and white one um i got it for christmas one year um i didn't know i was getting it i just opened the box and i was like get in and i just went upstairs on christmas day once everything was opened and it was light and everything i took it upstairs i was watching the telly i didn't care what it was i had a telly in my bedroom just a little normal twisty circular little wire aerial that was all it was uh, i was happy as a pig in shit that was my main present <laughs> Uh, I think it was the only one I ever got that, uh, yeah, that I had as from my parents. Yeah, got obviously years and years and years later when I was like living me own, got a little colour one and something was nothing then. But at the time, you had a black and white portable telly. Wow. That's brilliant. Like I said, uh, my memories of a portable TV was quite early. It was about 19, between 1980 and 1982. I had a black and white five inch. Uh, five inch screen wow. which had a tape deck and a radio player all in one that you carried around like a ghetto blaster and uh, the handle oh my it. god I remember them um, and that to me was like posh and it wasn't until a couple of years later that that was 
was old hat and we picked up our first and it was these dimensions a 14 inch color tv it was white i remember that as well My it was a white around I remember tuning it in. We, you you opened a panel, and there was a little screwdriver cog that was in this panel, and you had UHF bands for the, oh, for the God, yeah. to tune it in with UHF of, of around about 30 and 35 to do it, the individual channels. And it was, like I say, we had an aerial that you stood on top, and most of the time I'd have to move it off of the top of the telly over to the right and twist it to get any type of signal whatsoever because it was just an indoor aerial. And this indoor aerial was made out of thin aluminium that went around in a sort of heart loop like this with a plastic stand. So if you can imagine, it was like like a ribbon of metal. Yeah. It's amazing what I can I remember, remember as well, sometimes you'd, you could be watching it and you think, oh, what a cracking picture that is. And a car would pass. <laughs> a lot of guys, oh, he's gone. Do you mind not driving along this road when I'm watching this? Thank you very much. For me, for me, it, all all that had to happen was my nan would visit, go through the door, and that would cause the signal to bloody go. I don't know if it's yeah. because of dentures or what, but I'll tell you what, it was brain activity. But that that would kill the signal dead in my room, yeah. and I'd, I'd be going, "Nan, get out of the room! I was watching that." Uh, yeah, didn't didn't expect much. <laughs> but anyway, thanks very much for sharing that. Um, you you mentioned that you're in a store, so this one probably is pertinent to you. I've put when or did you ever own your own hi-fi unit for your for your for your bedroom? You know, for you, when you were living at your your home, like as in a proper hi-fi, not just a little crappy Amstrad record player. Yeah, yeah, as in a that'll have been life. that'll have been when I worked there. If I if I hadn't have worked there when I was sixteen, um, I probably would never have got into the whole hi fi thing. I'd have been happy plodding along with either my mum's fidelity dance set or my own little fidelity that I got for Christmas a few years previous. And then when you hear proper hi fi to these cheap, nasty little pieces of shite, it blows your mind. <laughs> And I remember the first hi-fi I got, I got from McKenna and Brown, but I had everything. It was all second hand, obviously. Um, I had everything but speakers. I thought I'd get speakers later. I thought I'll use my little crappy fidelity speakers. Of course, those little crappy fidelity speakers were lucky they didn't blow up with the power of the bloody JVC amp that I was putting them through. But they did me. And then when I got these modern short speakers, I played, I might have whacked the volume. It was like having a live band playing in the house. It was unreal in my bedroom. Um, so I started working there, 84. I must have got... I, I can't remember whether I got that hi-fi in 84 or 85. It didn't take me long, though, because like, as I was on the shop floor, um, to begin with, I was just like getting stuff out. If if anybody had bought a telly, I would get that out and get the new one out to replace it on the shelf. Or I would go around polishing stuff, all the hi-fi components. But I was allowed to play CDs and stuff while I was doing it and stuff. And if I had done that, I'd have been clueless about how decent records could sound. Um, so the first hi-fi I got, uh, JVC Amp. Um, it was a little JVC turntable, which sounded mint. Um, it was nothing too extravagant. Still had the weight on, you had to balance the weight properly, so it was a proper hi-fi one. Uh, and I got a, a silver Technics cassette deck. And then, like I say, it was later on when I could afford it, I got these modern short speakers. So that'll have been 84, 85. No, that's, that's absolutely brilliant. Um... The reason I asked that question as well, because it's from my own recollection. Uh, my sister had the largest bedroom. I had the smallest bedroom. I was the one where the boiler was in my room. And so there were, and, and the clo and closets were actually constructed, built into that room. So you couldn't move them. They were actually enclosed with the boiler inside the actual 
had it. So I had very little room. Um, and my sister's first present, you know, that she that I I I I knew that she loved was she used to have this Amstrad Hi-Fi. Now, if anybody knows anything about Hi-Fi's back in this particular period, shit, right? They all they were were pieces of four mica wood like wooden panels with a gloss looks like a really glossy hi-fi it was like aluminium with looks like they were separated but actually they were just grooves to separate them it was like a front panel with a volume yeah and, your cassette deck bro you had to send the whole unit off to get repaired <laughs> the record player would be at the top no word of a lie with a with a perspex top used to open up like this and underneath it you would have the radio well it would say mixer and then it would have um, um sort of like a a peaking volume mixing desk with a tape with a with the next bit being the tape deck i think and then the radio player at the bottom if i remember rightly which leads me to my next question um but um, before we end there I always wanted to one up my sister, and it was much later on that I got a hi fi. But my hi fi was Technics and it was stacking. So, up you, my sister, because you had an Amstrad piece of shit, and I had the best. And it's nice that you talked about CD as well as part of your hi fi, because it mentioned in the news that that was 1983. So, you were a very early adopter of CD, but I know that you love your vinyl, vinyl but. You were one of the early adopters because it was 1983 that the CD player, and we're talking about here, 1980 to 1984. So you got yours within probably the first 18 months of them being on the market. So you were. I didn't get mine different. until 86. I got mine so, in 86. So we, that was are, my first one. We talking, so we are talking the next period. So I mean, it doesn't matter. But I was operating them and I, I was familiar with them in the shop in 84. Yeah, they were bloody expensive. So the last yeah, the question, and this, this is for us old wrinklies, right? Do you remember the top 40, and did you record it off of the radio? I do remember the top 40 being on every Sunday, yeah. I mean, even in the 70s, we used to listen to it. I used to, in the 70s, I would listen out for Lalo Schifrin's disco version of Jaws. And then I went and bought the single. I now have an, a US import 12 inch single of said Lalo Schifrin um, track. But in the 80s, yeah, I mean, by then, my mum had bought a little hi fi cheap crap from Upton's. So I used to sit and wait and I'd just record the songs that I wanted. I wouldn't record the entire thing. But when it got to that point, I was well into the metal stuff. So I'd, right, I'd get ready because I made her in the charts or more the chat and I don't want another way before and just right ready record but so yes i did but not the entire program <clears throat> no that that's absolutely brilliant um so we reach the end of this particular block and i have to ask you again um memorable song from this period of 1980 to 1984 and there's so much here i know i'm gonna need you to figure because you've got ant music and all sorts of stuff going through here including spandau ballet duran duran and all sorts of stuff here um including synth synth stuff which i know that you wouldn't be part of but you're i'm pretty sure your metal was growing here um and then yeah. of course memorable tv film and remember i need to look for a link for this so but make it as obscure as you want it's it's what comes to your mind when you think 1980 to 84 and for me that's secondary school so i know my one but you carry on here and then remember we'll do the five second pause and move into the next section. Right. I am going to have to pick two songs because I can't narrow it down to one. Um, probably my favourite song from the same year, 1982, and totally obscure apart from each other. So the first one is... And the reason I'm picking this one is not only is it my favourite band, but this is my all-time favourite song ever because of the impact it had on me. Um, and it was the seven-inch single of uh, Iron Maiden, The Number of the Beast. They'd already released 
Run to the Hills, then the album, and I hadn't got the album yet. And then when they released the Number of the Beast single, I went and bought that without hearing it. When I played it, it's got this intro. This guy's reading the Revelations verse, and he sounds, it's not him, but it sounds like Vincent Price. And my God, the goosebumps. And then when the song kicks in, wow. I had, I'd gone straight in from school, got on the bus, went to the town and said, have you got the new Iron Maiden single? He went, yes, would you like a red one? I was like, there's a red vinyl? So I got the red vinyl, took it home, and I wore that bastard out. Um, and it's still my favourite song to this day. The other one had a massive impact on me as well. This is when I was kind of enjoying school. Was it? Was I getting bullied? Eighty two. Yeah, I must have been on and off. It wasn't quite as bad. They got it seemed to get worse as it went on. But this one always reminded me of girls I fancied. Um, the single I bought it off somebody at school. And I literally did wear it out. I would play it from me getting up to going to bed on repeat. Never get sick of it. And it was Save a Prayer. The Number of the Beast by Iron Maiden and Save a Prayer by Duran Duran, which still to this day is my favourite Duran Duran song as well. Film. Wow. I'm going to pick one for the cinema. And I'm going to pick a video here or one. The one from the cinema I saw at the cinema in 1980. And it was the first time I seen it. And me and a friend from school went to the ABC, which is no longer an ABC. It's a derelict building now. And it was a double bill. Uh, we were in there from about 12 o'clock till half past five. And it was Jaws and Jaws 2 straight after each other. Um, I was terrified. I was 12. Um, that opening scene of the first victim when she was getting dragged under, I felt like I was watching a real shark attack and I felt sick. I was shaking. It got me that bad. I was like, how is this a certificate A, which in English now is a PG? Thankfully, they put up to a 12. It should have always been a 15 or a 12 to me. Um, but, yeah, then when it was repeated on telly a year later, 81, wow, that was definitely my favourite film of all time. And then I'm going to pick the Burning because it was the first proper scary shit your pants gory horror slasher film i had the balls to watch because up until i was 15 i didn't like horror films to scare the shit out of me dracula and frankenstein was my maximum um i'd seen halloween when i was 13 on the telly and my god it terrified me but when i saw the burning blew me away that was it i was a horror hound from then on so yeah jaws for the cinema the burning for the video that's absolutely fantastic. And we did get all of that, but I have noticed that as we continue to move forward into the next um, hour, um, there's a lot of signal breakup, a lot of voice breakup, but we managed to get there in the end on this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put, I'm going to sort of like keep quiet for five seconds, but then I'm, I'm going to do something called a pause or a jump cut. And hopefully that will clear the buffer. Uh, and basically free up some memory so that the stutter goes away. And if it doesn't, then we'll probably get to the end of 1989-90, uh, Nigel, and we'll do uh, a, a part two. Because I do think that this has got some absolute dynamite stuff that I think people are definitely going to want to know about you on. I think they're going to love this. Personally, that's, that's me being um, probably being the protective father. <laughs> and optimistic as well um but i want it to be as sharp and as, uh, as as possible and like i say i'm doing this at quite high resolution so probably something that i might adapt next time to being slightly lower and therefore it'll it'll last longer and we'll get 1990 all the way up to present 
um, for the next part. But hey, we'll see how it goes. So I'm going to keep quiet for five seconds and then I'm going to do a pause. We can then talk for a couple of seconds and then I'll unpause it. Okay, so here we go with my pause for five seconds. So you, please, girls and boys, go and look at the writing and find that film and tune that Nigel has mentioned. And I'm showing up for five seconds. There we go. And with that, we're going to do this little jump cut that I talked about, and it will mean nothing to you guys. But then I'll unpause it, and we'll be we'll be continuing. Um, probably seconds for you guys, but we've been away for a couple of minutes and been discussing, and um, we've noticed there's been some technical things while we've been recording some some breakups. These things are quite new to me because it's my first time doing a recording of this nature. So we're going to split this into two. Uh, Nigel and I agree that we'll do the next second part later on this week, um, and we're going to get all the way to 1989. And, and then we'll uh, do a reflection and we'll look forward to doing 1990 to 2013 for the second part. Um, so as before, the news between 1985 and 1989. 56 people die at Bradford City Football Club fire. Wow. Uh, dire Straits, first band to sell over a million CDs. 1986, the Metro Center in Gateshead opens. The PM opens the completed M25, which started in 1976, I think it says there. I've got to read my own writing, so I do apologize. It gets really small when I have to write an awful lot. Uh, Prince Andrew and Sarah Ferguson marry as well in that year. 1987, the King's Cross fire killed 31 people. The big fire in the King's Cross tube station. Thatcher wins the third term as PM. So she continues through the 80s, which is why we know so much of the 80s as being just Thatcherism. Uh, Black Monday, 50 billion is wiped off of the value of shares at the end of that year. It was, called, it was the first time it was called Black Monday. 1988, Comic Relief is started. Wow. Edwina Curry, Edwina Curry says British eggs have salmonella bacteria in them. <laughs> Remember that. Uh, um, and 1989, um, I'm trying to read this. Oh, a memorial service was held for a Lockerbie disaster for the Lockerbie disaster. So that happened at the end of the previous year and the start of 1989. It was the end of the Cold War was declared. Wow. Uh, Salman Rushdie had an order to kill placed on him for Satanic Verses book. Do you remember that? The Satanic Verses book, Salman Rushdie. That's yeah, and I, I think still to this day it's never been lifted. Yeah, and that's the news between 1985 and 1989. So my first question is, you're now in adulthood, Nigel. Do you, did you buy your uh, music instrument, your, your bass, in this period between 1985 and 1989? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Um, I bought my first bass off my sister's my nephew my sister's eldest the one i said i was close with because uh, he was in a band and playing bass before i was uh and it, i remember it was an aria i think it was called a csb 380 beautiful looking bass but after listening to that compared to another one it, it didn't have much depth to it um i don't have it anymore um I won't say where it went. I'm still bitter about it. Uh, but yeah, um, I don't have it anymore. Uh, and being a bassist was actually a total accident. I always wanted to be a drummer. That's very interesting. I always, I always thought that the instrument that you picked up would be the instrument that you were most wanting to play. I didn't know that you wanted to be a drummer. 
ever since being little, um, I remember when Dance with the Devil by Cozy Powell come out. I think that was about 1973 or four. And I remember um, when he come on top of the pops, I used to stand up in the middle of the front room and play air drums to it. And I used to do it while I made my mother and father watch. Jesus. Um, Right, and I used to even like get knit needles and drum all over the furniture, even to Iron Maiden stuff as as far like as late as that. And then in I think it was 1981, he he got his first bass, 8081, which was the one I ended up getting. Um, and when I used to go to their house, I would pick it up and just play little bits. I could only play on one string. So I learned songs on one string. So my hand, I didn't know to change strings. And then I was learning um, when the second Maiden album come out, <laughs> um, the, the title track, Killers, of the Killers album. It starts off with like a, I can't describe it. It's like a high ND with a, and then followed straight by an octave lower. So it's like a do 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 And I was going like that on one string. Did it, did it, did it, oh, did it, did like, and, he, and the only lesson I've ever had was my nephew went to me, you do know, don't you, that that one, when you're doing that there, that note is the same as that fret there on the next string down. And I went, yeah, he went, well, that's how he plays it. I went, well, I can't play with two, three, four strings. He went, but it's a lot easier to try it. So I pressed this fret and I'm going two strings. Did it, did it, and I was like, that was it. I was away. I just like learning notes. I think so. If that's the case, if I do that there, I can find that easy instead of going like that because I'd progressed to two strings. So if I go on the next string, oh, that's a lot better. And the first song I ever learned properly using all four strings from start to finish was Save a Prayer, Duran Duran. That's amazing. Like I said, it's amazing how we learn. Um, when I was um, learning keyboard, everything was in the key of C. I couldn't understand how if you moved up a key, um, you would start introducing black notes in. You know what I mean? So C was basically all sort of like white notes, so you could play things like um, Let It Be, you know what I mean, which is in the key of C. So it was really simple because it was all white notes. You know what I mean? Simple as that, really. Um, and then you move to the black ones, you get into majors and minors and flats and all that type yeah, of sharps. Yeah. And then it's sevens and all sorts of stuff, you know, which is much more comprehensive. So it's brilliant to have that sort of insight. And it gives also people an understanding of where we started from, you know, because I remember it was always a running joke, status quo, they only know about, what, five chords or something. Was it three chords? And they just slipped between them. and They were, they were considered the joke. Because that's all that they did. They just went between these chords. It was it's it's amazing. Well, you know um, that video I did, the 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 cover, the the, the hallow be thy name I had made and cover I did. Yes, yes, I did. Uh, I don't know a single note of music. Somebody said to me, "Oh, this is a C." I go, well, you know, "Just play the fucking thing, and I'll follow you." Everything I learned, it's by here. So I. I learned that song just by playing along with the, the record. Believe it or not, playing by ear is considered to be by some the hardest thing to learn because anybody can read um, after a while. You know, there are obviously people that have trouble reading. When it comes to notes, what you're doing is is you're just transposing um, what you see in front of you as what's on the keyboard. By ear, you've got nothing, only the sound. So mm -hmm. sometimes, believe it or not, when somebody turns around and said, I learned to play by ear, that was the hardest way to go. Um, believe it or not, I learned sheet music when I was at music school. So, and I learned classical music. And my background with vinyl even was, was with my family and soundtracks. So I was more, I mean, one of my favorite records when I was about five years old was Peter and the Wolf classical piece of music where they had different instruments for the animals you know you had um you know a fox 
Brooks and all of this. And uh, Peter had his own tune. It went. Yeah, I remember that. And each instrument was part of the orchestra. And that's how you learn the orchestra. These are all stepping stones that, and I think people get put off. I can't learn an instrument at my age uh, because they think I've got to learn all of this. You don't. Think of your favorite tune. Do that. Break it down into just little notes. Have it simplified. And then do the flourishes in between later on. And you'll be there. You can, you can I mean, take it like this. Lady Gaga's um, Born This Way is four chords. That's it. You learn four chords and you've learned the whole of that song. Simple as that. So don't think of anything as being like that intro to clocks. It sounds really complex. All it is is three notes that would have been the chords and he split it into three. That's all he's doing. Instead of pressing the three down to do a chord, he's just basically doing the three notes and then moving to the next. It is as simple as that. But anyway, I'm digressing. We could talk about music probably for <laughs> years. We'll move on to the next one, which is quite a fun little one I put here. What was dating like now that you've left school? Jesus. Um, for me personally, non-existent. Uh, I tried, <clears throat> but being so meek and mild, I think I went through my entire senior school life fancying four, four girls, I think, all in my year. Not one of them was having any of it. Uh, the, the irony is, and it really annoyed me this, one of them I, got, I became very, very good friends with. And then when we became friends, she made it obvious that she liked me. And at that point, I didn't like her that way anymore, and I fancied somebody else. And at this point as well, I hadn't even kissed anybody, apart from in the, the juniors where she had to peck. And she tried to, and I backed away. I was like, no, I'm scared. I'm too, I was, I was petrified. I remember my mum had a CB radio, and she came over this day and we were on this CB because she was on as well, and she just sat on my knee and while I'm talking away, she's doing that on my lip. And I thought, this is a bit flirty. That's what she was obviously getting anyway. I, when she was due to go, I took her back to the like, I just set her to the bus stop right near where I lived. I don't even know where she lived, to tell you the truth. And she's grabbed hold of my hand, like we're walking along, old nans, and these kids are going, Whoop, you've got a girlfriend. Fuck off. You obviously think I do, so I think what you want. Um, I didn't get my first girlfriend. I'm still class the ones when you're little. I didn't get my first girlfriend till I was 18. And that was the mother of my kids. And people don't believe me, you know, because of how I am, Kobe I am now. People, like, when I used to work in the dialysis place, patients would go, ah, I bet you've got a string. I went, no, I really don't. I've had, um, I've had three serious relationships in my life. Um, the mother of my kids, I was with her for 18 years. And we split up in 2004, on with my next one which I won't go into, that lasted three years and she left me to go with somebody else who had different equipment to me, let's say. And then I was single for a year and then I met Laura when I was 40. Um, that year when I was single, I, I had my youth, I had me daft little fling with two or three people in that year and then I met Laura, but yeah, until 18-year-old, I had been with nobody, so I didn't have a date in life at all. And the mother of my kids, I only met her because she lived around the corner from me. And I hated her. Absolutely hated her. Um, but when we got together, at the time, bear in mind, this is 80s, nobody thought a thing. I was 18 and she was 15. But we were together for 18 years, so it was only a three-year difference. 
but when you're 18 and 15 it's like whoa it was just like hey dodgy be careful that was as bad as it got it wasn't like pay the file and all this shit like it is now um and like i say we were together for 18 years but up until then no dating for me matey nothing at all very interesting like i said it's it's nice to have an insight like i said and remember um Nige, um i always said if, if something is too sensitive you don't need to need to talk about it for me um yeah it was when i was 1920 that i basically got what i considered to be my first girlfriend um and so we're talking about 1990 so we'd be into the next section that we'd have to talk about for that for, for me um but i do remember that um i did have um a couple of girlfriends um because during this period um the, the one girl that i really liked didn't like me we um and it, it devastated me um I was sending flowers every week to say, you know, I'm sorry, but I still want to be friends and all of this. It was pretty, pretty messy. And it got to the point where she lived in another village further away from my town. Every Sunday, um, I walked five miles to her house and walked five miles back. I got up on a Sunday morning at five in the morning delivered a letter and then walked back, got into bed, had two hours kip, got up and then had the rest of the Sunday. And I went from the 20 stone bloke at that age, you know, in, in, at 16 um, to 14 and a half stone. I went from a 14 wow. inch waist down to a 34 inch waist. Wow. And things change in your body where if you're fat, things look small. You know, you were talking a little bit about he had bigger whatever. Um, yeah. yeah. I noticed that when I went to a 34-inch waist, it was like, really? It's that big? <laughs> I'm quite Wow, well, look, I'm King Dong. Thank, yeah. you, thank you very much. Um, and that's the boosting confidence that you need. And that's what uh, made me um, become a little bit more outward. I would start, I used to go into clothes shops, Burton's in particular and i would buy these shirts and waistcoats and jackets i had mustard jacket red um claret jackets with jeans uh and a, and a and a shirt that would be outside of your trousers for the first time because i now always used to have my shirt tucked in when i was fat because i didn't like the feel of the waistband around my gut and the shirt used to stop that because i was it was tucked in um I now wore it outwards, and because of the, the thinness of me, it looked modern and nice. This is the sort of thing that I'm talking about. So, yeah, um, I totally get where you're coming from with there, and that's my little um, secret out there in the world. I haven't really talked about that for too much. Um, so, moving on, because this is this is this is a breakout period. This is where you've left school. You've gone. You 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 were in a YTS. I was in a YTS, by the way. Um, and for a couple of years, while I was trying to find my way into a career, I was a stack putting stuff on shelves, working for Summerfield. Is it Summerfield they were called? It was the co-op that turned into Summerfield, yeah. I think. Uh, anyway, they then turned into Gateway and all sorts of stuff later on. Um, so I'm going to ask the next question, which is, did you learn to drive after school or was it later? in your life that you were able to drive because i know that you've got a car and you showed off your new car to me in pictures uh late last year so did you learn to drive in this period or was it a little bit later on in life yeah um i think i must have started driving let doing my lessons in 88 i think i passed my test in february 89 so i will have just turned 21 which i think i thought at the time was quite late because usually like people like oh, that's it i'm 16 17 getting my provisional ordered but at the time i wasn't working and it just wasn't doable um what once i'd left the tv shop because like after my yts that did keep me on for a while and all the road uptons which is like the the place i mentioned you said 
but it was more of a department Kenner and Brown out and then when they did that I was gone they made cuts so I was gone so I was out of work for a couple of years um, and I I had a couple of placements with that, but that led to me a job as well. Um, what, was I, what was I on about before that? What was the question again? I always ramble and lose where I'm up to. Just um, what car you first bought after you passed your test? Did you actually pass your test during yeah. this period? Yeah. So, yeah, up until that point, yeah, I'd, pass, I'd, I'd started to pay by my leg. Um, or sometimes one of four I passed my second time and it was February 89 and I was like what the hell am I going to do at that time my sister was selling her first car um, and I got it I was less than 100 quid I think it was 50 quid or something. it was a banger like there was hardly any floor you sit in you could see the floor go like that and the hole in the bottom but it was a little white mini it was my first car oh my god I loved it used to get me to work and back to Regger and back um I didn't have it long and I got rid. Um, and then I got a, I think it was a little mini Metro. The next one I got, I brought those little beige car things. Again, another bit of a hole, shit hole. Um, uh, but it, it, I tell you what, it got me to London and back twice. No, it didn't. Got me to London and back and to Wolverhampton and back. That same car. So yeah, my first car was a white mini. And I passed my test in 89. That's brilliant. Um just to give a little bit of background with mine, um, I passed my test in a Fiat Tipo, Timpo, Tipo, Timpo, something like that, Fiat Tipo. It was a weird looking car. Um, but when I passed my test, the first thing my uh, father did for me was he, he, he went out with me to get a car, but he wanted me to get a car that he knew he could work on because he was a mechanic before he worked in a factory. And we yeah. bought an Austin Austin Maestro 1750. It had the actual words, numbers, 1750, which was supposed to denote the engine size. It was a 1750cc engine. When I was driving that to work, everybody said, is that the year it was made? Because it was that old. You know, it was a white tank with, uh, it had those alloy um, hub covers. <laughs> it used to cover the wing cover the nuts at the time. God, I remember Real them. Um, you know, the seats were so slippery. It was unbelievable. You know, I mean, it was made, supposed to be leather seats, but it was almost like a plasticky leather. Yeah. And, you, you know, sat in it, and you could sort of like move around in it with the seat belt on. I mean, a, a weird car. And the gear stick was a really thin gear stick that, you know, you had to actually sort of do that with it. You know, I mean, it's yeah. stuff little just the little notions that you do with the gear stick these days so yeah i i know what you're talking about because um, um the first time it had to go for its mot the first time i had to go for its mot it failed on most of the things was welding it needed welding for the floor and welding for this that and the other my dad turned around and he said i can get that done for about 30 quid because where the, the first place we took it to the MOT was at Lucas. And they wanted £400. We only bought the thing for 100 quid. That's how much the car was. They wanted £400 to get it through its MOT. My dad took it away, spent about 50 quid, took it to a totally different MOT place, went through like a dream. Had that car for 18 months. But I got so sick of people taking the piss out of me that my next car was a 205 GT. And I'll never forget that because my dad turned around and said, what you bought that small thing for? And he didn't like them, what I paid for it either, which was the first time I'd spent five or six grand on something, right? It was two or three years old, uh, but it was a GT, which meant it had twin carburettors. And it went like shit off the shovel. It was a 1.4 twin carburettor just below a GTI. And a 205 GTI was a must-own car at that particular period of time anyway we're talking about cars the next question to you nige is i, were you, I don't know about were, you oh go on. but i've got a thing up here you're saying recording error open the recording tab to learn more and i've got a message there 
Mine's still saying it's going. Recording two fourteen. Manson is recording error with a line through it. How weird! Never mind. We'll, we'll, we'll try and we'll hopefully. Um, fingers crossed, uh, girls and boys. I do apologise. We'll tr we might have to do this section again, but we'll continue and then see how it goes. Yes. So the yes. next question, because we've only got three questions to go, and then it's the memorable bit, is: Were you part of the nightclub scene? Absolutely not. I never went once. The first time I went to a nightclub, oh my god! I think I was in my thirties. Didn't interest me. I never. I didn't even go to pubs. I was a. I was a hermit. I used to stay at home, play my records, stay in my bedroom. I think it was because of the bullying thing again. <clears throat> so I remember when I used to go into the town during the day on Saturday when I was off school as a teen. I must have had some sort of invisible thing on me, like. Please bully me. Lads have come up to me like, oh, bloody blah, 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 you little wanker and all this. I didn't even know me. But I remember one lad who did it. He was actually from the same estate and I knew him to look at. And he just made me like that. I remember once riding past him, my bike just spat in my face. I was like, nice, thanks. Yeah, lovely. So, no, uh, it just put me off going. I used to hear about all fights and stuff. So, I, I just didn't, it was not my thing. And it still isn't really. I like the, I go the odd night out, but I'm more of a go to a pub, sit down, talk. I don't like music y things. And I certainly don't dance. That's interesting. Like I said, the reason I ask that is not only will we go into the pubs, but if you were, if you were the sort of person that was earning money um, and, you know, you'd lost your weight and all that sort of stuff and got some confidence. At the end of going to the pub, some of us would go, should we go to a nightclub? So I just wondered whether it was a sort of like period of time where you were doing the thing. So if you were going to the pub, then you'd finish at the pub and you would go home. Then I take it that's pretty much uh, if you were going to nightclubs. No, nothing, nothing like that at all. Didn't go. I didn't even go into a pub until I was 18, I don't think. Um, and that was like just for uh, during the daytime with two of my mates. We'd be at the cinema. We just went for one or two pints in the middle of the afternoon. Um, I dare say, if I'd have been going out regularly and brought out Michelle quicker, I probably would have met somebody quicker as well. That's brilliant. I'm going to do something um, just quickly here. I'm going to hit the pause button to see whether it starts your recording again. So to these guys, it will mean nothing. So... Um, we'll join you in just a second. So that's absolutely brilliant. So you weren't part of the nightclub scene then, Nige. So no. um, what happened in during this period um, is that movies became cheaper to, to buy on sell through. Um, the sell through market was a was a big thing because until that point we were renting things, and all of a sudden now you could go to W H Smith and buy um, films in pan and scan. For about 9.99 and even a little bit later on in this period of time uh widescreen would become a thing and those were like 14.99 and 20th century fox started off this whole widescreen craze the first one was star wars along with two others i think die hard was part of the launch lineup it was die hard star wars and, and one other later on bonds and all sorts of stuff uh came into it um was this period of time of sell through the start of your collection or did you start earlier um vinyl i'd always been getting vinyl but yeah videos you had to either be very rich or very lucky and get the extra rental and the first thing i got from what i remember um I did buy my first tape. It wasn't even a cell that we just come straight out. And uh, it was an Iron Maiden video EP. It was the four promo videos for the four singles that they had out from the, the first two Bruce Dickinson albums. And then the next one I got was Jaws and Jaws 2, uh, pre set as well, X Rentals. And then it wasn't long after that that they did start to come out, like for a, for a tenner each. So. It started with that. That's brilliant. Like I said, everybody's got to start somewhere, which is why I brought it in about your film collection. Um, because for me, VHS was pretty much when I started. So, you know, and and pretty much I think I think the first 
what I owned was an ex rental. And then I started to buy sell through. So, you know, some people can have a similar way to their start. And some people were much later and even didn't even start till DVDs or even, mm -hmm. you know, much younger than us. Their only thing that they've ever known is 4K. So, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting question to bring up. Uh, and the last question is another thing that was quite a first between 1985 and 1989 is that satellite and cable became cheaper. Um, so were you an early adapter uh, by, uh, of having Sky or B Sky B or uh, having a cable channel? Because you're up north and cable was something that was introduced before any of us in the south ever got anything unless you lived in London. So it's a pertinent question to, for any of that. Uh, what's your answer to that one then, Nigel? Uh, no, we had nothing like that. My sister, um, not the one who's got the the two sons, the other the other one who's got well, she's got four or five kids. Um, she got cable around about oh eighty three, eighty four, and I remember it was so strange because after the whole um, video nasties joke they'd released friday the 13th and friday the 13th part two on vhs which after the whole video nasty these things were quickly taken off the shelves and i was like part three's out when's it gonna come out and then my nephew said to me are you going to our jubilees soon i went probably yeah why well, i used to babysit a lot for he went Friday the 13th, part three's on cable. I went, what? So took took a video over and recorded it. I remember thinking, Jesus, the picture on this is shit, with it being filmed in 3D. Um, and I remember watching it even then thinking, compared to the first two, this one's pretty piss poor. I enjoyed it, but it was nowhere near as good. To this day, it still astounds me when people say part three is their favourite. Don't know where that comes from. So recording that off cable, I think that that was the only thing I did have. The first time I ever got cable or anything like that was when, oh god, I, I mean I had kids then with my first girlfriend and stuff. Um, me, me eldest daughter and me son were born, and uh, the the whole new sort of boom of cable come out because when cable came out when my sister had it, you still had like loads of like weird lines going across. It looked weird. It was like a like a souped up video, but with lines through. <clears throat> but when we got it, it was when Comcast came out, and it was at the time it was like, "Wow, look at this! It's so clear." And that was when we got it. So I think that was about nineteen ninety five. Yeah, so Four, a little bit. So a little bit after, yeah, possibly six. Might be in early ninety six. So I remember the, the the music videos that were on at the time very popular were um, Madonna's Ray of Light, uh, Metallica's Fuel, and a song called uh, Oh God, what did they call? They were a boy band that lasted all of two minutes. Um, I think it was called Say It Once. I think wow, well, what was the band called? It's like a boy band. Normally, the stuff I, I hate, but I really like this song. I've got the CD single somewhere, and can I help think of the, the name of them? But it, it would have been about 95, possibly early 96. That was the first time I personally had some form of cable. That, that's brilliant. And like I said, we, we can talk about that in, when we get to the 90s. For me, it's also the 90s. It's when I moved away from home. I moved to Manchester in late, later on in life in 1999, and I suddenly came across a company called Cable & Wireless, which then turned into MTL. Um, so they offered um, satellite through a cable and also gave you your broadband, which was now suddenly moving away from a telephone line into fiber optic and, and fast broadband speeds. So that's brilliant. And that ends this section. So as you know, as we end this section, I need from you a memorable song that covers the period between 1985 and 1989 and either or both a memorable TV or a memorable film 
for this particular period that I will then leave a link for in the description. 85 to 89. I remember the name of that band, by the way. It's Ultra. Um, a song and a film or TV programme from 85 to 89. Um, film. Wow, this is a toughie. I keep going to say for the film Beverly Hills Cop or Nightmare Elsewhere, but they were both 84. So 85, got one. I'm going to say Friday the 13th, part five, A New Beginning, because it came out that year, and that was the first Friday the 13th I ever got to see at the cinema. I seen parts one, two, and three. I hadn't seen four, the final chapter, and then five came out in the cinema, and I absolutely lapped it up. It got slated. I loved it. Um, a song between 85 and 89. Um, I'm going to say the first one that's jumped into my mind is a song by David Lee Roth, who was the original singer to Van Halen. And his second album was called skyscraper and i saw him on that tour in donnington when i went to see iron maiden headline and i kept, i couldn't stand him and as soon as i seen him on that stage and when i heard his music i went and bought his entire back catalog so his second album was called skyscraper and the song that i remember the most on that album is the actual track called skyscraper it's weird because the memories I have of that song, it's it's when I lived in the flat with the mother of my children. And it's just got so I've just got so many fond memories of it. So yeah. Skyscraper, David Lee Roth, and Friday the thirteenth, five a new beginning. T V uh, show. Yeah, far away. Prisoner cell block H. I know it was out in the 70s and 80s and 80s in, in Australia, but we didn't get it till then. Oh, my God. Late 80s, I would not miss an episode. Was that Channel 4 or Channel 5 that that was on at late at night? Time tease. Channel, oh, ITV at late at night then. Yeah, ITV. Yeah. Like, I remember Vinegar yeah. Tit. I remember the song at the end with, she used to bring me She used to bring me roses. Yeah. Which I had no idea what that meant about in the in, about in the context of a of a lady's prison. I don't know what the hell that's got to do. Plus, me and me, me and me dad came up with our own version. We used to sing. He used to sniff my panties. <laughs> I can imagine. Because <laughs> the body. Of your dad, I wish he would again. Then we'd just crease. Yeah, I, I mean, we haven't talked too much about your 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 family other than me talking about. What were your parents doing and all of that sort of stuff and you can probably start off the next period if you want reflecting on how how the bond with your dad became as strong as it did uh yeah. or with your mother because uh, most people will have a stronger bond with one or the other you might have them both at the same time uh, but it'll be interesting to know that before we get into the 90s because i know that there is a sad end to that as we get towards the end of that segment and it might be quite good to round off um your video uh, with a little homage you know so that's the end of this section and i'm so sorry that we've had some technical difficulties i'm hoping that we're not going to scrub a whole section because we've got a problem on niger's side that said that the recording has stopped so i don't even know if you've just been hearing me talk <laughs> until we get to the end but if you do like this and we are still going to do a, a second part um please um uh, please do watch the second half I, it's all i can actually ask anybody to do um we, we'll work out I, I i'd like it to be something that is on uh niger's side of things and on mine he can you know so that it gets out there because the reason for that is i'm collaborating and i want people to know more about my friend Nige. this isn't about promoting my side of the channel this is something i want to do but i don't want it to become only seen by a few people because i've got less people that watch my channel so 
the opportunity I'm leaving it out for Nige is that he can take my my notes and everything with the links, do his own link, you know, his own little write up, and he can have it on his side if he wants with his own little banner. <laughs> um, and um, we'll 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 get this second part done. And all I can say is thanks very much, Nige, for spending um, this uh, period of time to record the last couple of hours. Uh, and I've had a I've had a I don't know about you, but I've had a blast. I've got to know an awful lot about you, but it's just been re fun reminiscing just over so much stuff that I don't naturally get to talk about. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you very much for asking me. I've, I've had an absolute blast. I've really, really enjoyed it. I really have. Um, I've thought of stuff that I've not thought of in many years. Um, most of it good, but with a couple of bad ones thrown in as well. But that's that's unavoidable. I mean, it's not that bad that I'm going to go away and dwell on it, nothing like that. But it's just like, you know, when you think back to bullying and stuff like that, it does, it makes you go, that was awful at the time. Um, but I think that prick got what, what was coming to him by the looks of it. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I hope he survived. I do. I don't know if he did, but I hope he did. I wouldn't wish that on him. But a bit of karma come back there. Um, but yeah, most of it was good. I've, I, I'd wear, I've, I've had a blast. I've really enjoyed it. That's absolutely fantastic. So I'm going to let you end your particular side with your famous quote, if you want to do it. And then I will do my normal, how I end my side of things. And then I'll be hitting the end recording button. So over to you, Nigel, with your ending uh, that you do on all of your, all of your videos. <laughs> uh, I hope I haven't bored you all. And, Thank you very much for watching, all two of you. I do hope you've enjoyed it, and I shall see you very soon on a future presentation, which is French for presentation. He has to be one better, doesn't he? And with mine, it is yes. salute. Until next time. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. <laughs>